So, in the last few classes, you probably have been introduced to the subject of vaccines. Vaccines have been known since the last maybe more than a hundred years. Conventionally, vaccines were made up of live but attenuated pathogens. There are vaccines to viruses as well as bacteria. Now, with more and more understanding of the molecular mechanisms of an immune reaction and the molecules that were required for generating these responses, both T and B cells, people started looking towards easy an easy way of obtaining vaccines. The first step towards this was use of recombinant proteins that is proteins that were made by or expressed by the recombinant DNA technology. And further to this instead of using large proteins or large molecules or the entire molecule, immunologists have taken the reductionists approach and have been successfully using peptides instead of the entire molecule. I am not going to deal with recombinant vaccines except just to touch upon very briefly. Gene coding for any protein can be expressed by the recombinant DNA techniques that is very well known and recombinant proteins have been available for a very large number of years. So, also recombinant vaccines. Now, though most of these recombinant vaccines are still under trial, they are the first such antigen which has been used and is in the market is the one for hepatitis B virus. So, a vaccine which is made from the hepatitis B surface antigen. This is this was obtained or this is being obtained by the recombinant DNA technology, where the gene coding for the hepatitis B surface antigen which affords a protective response. The gene is isolated, amplified and put into a construct and express the, the protein is expressed in either the bacterial system or the eukaryotic system. Now, this is known to give a protective response. Like I said, I am not going to deal with recombinant vaccines except just introduce this. There are other recombinant proteins which are on trial beta subunity of cholera toxin, sporozoid proteins of malarial parasite. In fact, there are, ex there are very many um, research groups who are looking at uh, different proteins, target proteins of the malarial parasite, enterotoxin of E. coli as well as HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. Now, are is it uh, are the, is the use of recombinant proteins really advantageous? Does it afford protection the way the native protein or the native pathogen induces? No, it is not so, especially if you are using a protein which has been expressed let us say E. coli or in uh, a eukaryotic expression system. The reason for not affording a complete immune response by recombinant proteins is because let us say if the protein is corresponding to a neutralizing epitope of a particular virus the virus or an, a bacteria. These are when injected would be taken by the antigen presenting cells and presenting the antigen to the helper T cells for the generation of cytotoxic T cells which would really be I mean, development of which really would constitute a complete immune response not just the antibodies. These are done by the presentation of antigen is done through MHC class 1 as all of you all already know because cytotoxic T cells are MHC 1 restricted T cells. Therefore, pathogens or well bacteria and viruses need to be intracellular when the proteins corresponding to these are express in the context of class 1 molecule. So, while recombinant proteins do have the ability to elicit a good antibody response, MHC class 1 restricted cytotoxic T cell response is meager. 
So, anyway that is not where immunology stopped. To overcome this disadvantage recombinant vector vaccines were developed and the ones that are quite well known are the vaccinia virus, polio virus attenuated, adenovirus. Now, vaccinia virus which of course, you might uh, this has been used to eradicate smallpox. This vi the genome of this vaccinia virus can be used to carry a dozens of foreign genes without impairing its capacity to infect and replicate in host cells. And the, vi the, the immunogens or the vaccines that are being developed in using vaccinia virus as the vector are hepatitis B, HSV, influenza and it has been shown that proteins thus expressed are able to activate both the humoral as well as the cell mediated immunity because as one can imagine that the virus the vaccinia virus harboring these foreign proteins can infect cells and mimic what would happen in case of intracellular parasite. So, now I come to what I will be dealing with the topic of the lecture today and that is synthetic peptides. Now, like I told you of course, one can use the, the parasite attenuated forms of the parasite for I mean as extremely good vaccines but it is not always easy to be able to let us say in case of HIV it would be very difficult to uh, replicate the virus in vitro. There are of course, also dangerous viruses and dangerous bacteria and therefore, instead of using the entire organism why not use parts of the organism which on their own cannot replicate. Now, this has with this understanding immunologists have started carrying out a molecular dissection of antigens to understand you know what is molecular dissection as looking at the given the entire sequence of the protein corresponding to a particular virus or bacteria which is known to afford a neutralizing uh, virus neutralizing or pathogen neutralizing response to find out in this molecule which regions are immunogenic both by way of T cell response as well as P cell response. Now, this has been of course, people have also looked at proteins as such from an academic interest not necessarily only to understand or to make a vaccine, but all this information has helped people to identify smaller regions of fragments or peptides of these larger molecules, which can mimic the antigenic sites on proteins and therefore, protective immune response can be elicited. Now, there, such, there are large number of such studies available in literature and I am only you know, just mentioning very few example of this peptide being peptides being used to mimic antigenic sites that means, not the entire molecule, but smaller fragments thereof. Examples are uh, that protective immunity could be elicited through uh, identification of you know uh, by injecting peptides uh, corresponding to foot and mouth disease, influenza, HBV, cholera um, just by simple immunization of these with these peptides. So, these are of course, experimental or research. Now, for all these to come into the market of course, it would take much uh, time with appropriate validation. The antibody production against a synthetic peptide of course, would be extremely useful when the natural antigen is not available or inadequate amounts or if it is unstable you know once when it is purified or isolated from wherever if it is unstable. Also, if that pathogen is extremely dangerous. So, therefore, it would be good in these situations to have a synthetic peptide. Synthetic peptides you know getting antibodies to synthetic peptides would also be very useful for purifying the native protein or the native pathogen right. So, synthetic peptides are extremely useful of course, once to be able to determine which peptides would yield useful antibodies is something which we will discuss as we go along. Now, advances in gene cloning and DNA sequence technologies uh, has 
actually given enough in information. Earlier what people would do, I mean this was much before the molecular, you know biology methodologies become, became uh, commonplace in laboratories. Uh, people used to look at the, you know derive this amino acid sequence of proteins which would be pretty laborious. But after the you know molecular biology techniques being started you know coming to laboratories as common techniques, it is not difficult at all to obtain the DNA sequence of a particular gene and looking at the complementation, it is not difficult to predict the amino acid sequence. And then there are several algorithms that are available now to predict antigenic determinants. Now, this part I have already discussed in brief in some of my earlier classes. Now, let us go back to the fundamentals of definitions of immunogenicity and antigenicity. Now, we already have discussed earlier that immunogenicity and antigenicity though they are very related, these terms are different because immunogenicity is the ability of a protein to generate an immune response. Whereas, antigenicity pertains to the capacity of a protein to bind specifically to the functional binding site of the antibody or the product of the immune response which is the antibody. Let us think in terms of what is also you know what I will be using constantly and which of course, I have also used earlier antigenic determinants versus a, or epitope the portion of the antigen that comes into contact with the paratope of the antibody. This is known as the antigenic determinant or the epitope. So, as you might remember from my earlier class, B cell epitopes can be classified as either conformational or sequential. So, if the B cell epitope is, is conformational, it constitutes a group of residues that are not contiguous. You can say if you stretch out this particular molecule, then there would be three different regions which are separate from each other in the primary amino acid sequence, but they are brought together by folding of the polypeptide chain or for that matter there could also be two chains that come together. You know, suppose a protein has two subunits and bringing of the subunits together can constitute an epitopic region sequential on the other hand a sequential epitope is that which is which comprises of a stretch of contiguous residues which of course, would have distinct conformational features. Now, the understanding of a sequential epitope is not one still has to remember that it is the conformation of the sequence of a particular set of amino acids which constitutes an epitope. So, it in both cases is conformational, but while one you know it is it is uh, we think in terms of one should probably say discontinuous and continuous. There are large number of proteins that have been studied you know also these proteins which are ep, uh, of the pathogen which afford or induce good immune responses. There are very many you know in reports, but there are three model proteins which I just like to introduce to you. And these model proteins have served as the basis for antigenic you know for first uh, they have also uh, served as the basis for uh, some of these algorithms that have been developed to identify B cell epitopes. Hen egg lysozyme I have alluded to this molecule earlier. This molecule is made up of 120 amino acids, but there are 4 intra disulfide bonds. Interestingly antibodies to the native that means, the native conformation where the 4 intra disulfide bonds are in place antibodies to the native HEL do not react with denatured HEL. Triptych fragments of reduced HEL that means, when you reduce these bonds and then now you cleave the protein with trypsin which will target all lysines. Now, triptych fragments of reduced HEL do not react with antibodies to the native HEL. However, this is again quite interesting that if the protein is not reduced HEL hen egg, li hen egg lysozyme is in its native conformation 
and now digested with trypsin which would mean only lysines which are available in this folded conformation would be susceptible to cleavage. So, when triptych digests of native HEL were made these yielded 3 antigenic fragments and this constituted about 85 percent of the antigenic activity of the native molecule. That means, if there are antibodies which are raised to native HEL and now the native molecule is digested such that there are 3 fragments you know the entire conformation remains similar and only so there would be sort of domains which are formed which are I mean obtained. Now, 85 percent of the reactivity of the polyclonal anti serum could be accounted for in these 3 particular fragments. Further to the hen egg lysozyme story this of course, I have already talked to you about earlier that there were 2 peptides made from one of the domains of this HEL. Now, in the, if the peptide was linear and was injected for making uh, for raising antibodies or if the peptide was now rest, uh, restrained by making a disulfide bond such that there would be a looped conformation the antibodies to the looped conformation did not recognize the linear. So, however, I should emphasize that antibodies to the linear peptide did recognize the. So, definitely they are distinctly conformational dependent and or uh, antibodies to continuous versus discontinuous epitopes. The third pro the second protein is myoglobin which has in you know, a extensive studies have been carried out with this protein. This is a single polypeptide chain of 153 amino acids which is folded in a compact helical structure. Many people have worked on this protein and interestingly one of those I mean of course, the study uh, you know, people have found differences with respect to the immunogenesis uh, sorry the antigenicity. However, I will just talk about Atasi et al who have really carried out extensive analysis or they have actually molecular dissection of myoglobin to try to understand the epitopes present. Now, Atasi et al delineated 5 distinct continuous epitopes by the following they have made they have injected myoglobin raised polyclonal antibodies. Now, they have carried out trypsin digestion of this molecule and taking these fragments have looked for the ability of these fragments to inhibit the binding of myoglobin to the antibodies. So, that it was found that there were sev 5 continuous epitope which constituted or were able to bring about inhibition to about 85 percent of the reactivity of myoglobin with its antibodies. So, they said that there are more continuous epitopes rather than discontinuous epitopes, but like I said that you know this above study has been challenged by several other studies and especially by monoclonal antibodies that were raised to the antigen never mind we will go to the third model protein. This is a much more complex you know we started off with a smaller uh, molecule like HEL, but it has 4 intra disulfide bonds and now we went on with the myoglobin and tobacco mosaic virus is the third model protein which is of course, a much larger protein because it is a rod shaped virus that is made up of several identical protein subunits arranged as a helix around the RNA molecule. Now, each subunit is made up of 153 amino acids. So, what people have looked for now these are this will also tell you what are the various um, experiments that are carried out to dissect out the epitopes of a particular protein. Now, by inhibition assays with short peptides 7 continuous determinants were identified. Okay. So, with shorter peptides 7 continuous determinants were identified. However, when they made longer peptides another 3 were identified. What does that mean? That in fact, you need to have slightly larger proteins uh, sorry uh, larger peptides which can assume a conformation which is similar to what is present in the native conformation of the protein. Also monoclonal antibodies raised to the intact virus particle identified several continuous epitope, but these were not always on the surface of the molecule which would mean that yes now when one immunizes an animal you can get an antibody response which could be to epitopes 
which are not available when you are looking for binding of these antibodies to the um, to the to the antigen. So, the contribution I am telling you all these because all these observations have gone on to uh, establishing different algorithms to be able to predict B cell epitopes. In protein antigens, the epitope paratope interaction occurs over a surface of 16 to 20 Armstrong in diameter and this is the size found in discontinuous epitope. So, why this is important is because when one looks for a particular you know tries to identify it uh, or design synthetic peptides corresponding to a particular protein then one should look at a size which would be at least covering 16 to 20 angstroms. Now, of course, in case of smaller pept you know molecules like haptans this may be smaller smaller than 16 to 20, but by and large with globular proteins it would be 16 to 20 angstrom. Now, we will come to okay, we know that synthetic peptides are being researched upon to see whether these can induce antibodies that can recognize the native protein. Let us first look at what are the limitations of this peptide antigens. Antibodies raised against peptides can fail to work in immunoassays, especially when the target protein is you know folded extensively. The reasons for failure can be that the peptide sequence is buried in the folded protein or the binding site is blocked by glycosylation or other post translation modification like phosphorylation or acetylation. The antibodies to peptides are unable to bind to the folded structure like I said in the first sentence itself uh, which is presented on this slide that antibodies raised against peptides may not bind to the target protein if it is an extensively folded one. However, despite all these limitations these which would be disadvantages peptide antibodies are highly specific biochemical tools during protein purification. So, if you can identify a peptide I mean let us say from a molecule one identifies several peptides and I will tell you how being uh, looked at or in recent times by algorithms you you would definitely eventually end up with a, at least one peptide which is able to induce antibodies that bind to the native conformation of the protein and therefore can be used for protein purification. So, they are extremely specific and highly you know ex ex extremely good biochemical tools and sometimes like in cases of infectious particles peptides are the only realistic possibility for test development for a particular given protein. So, now we come to designing synthetic peptides as immunogen. For designing a synthetic peptide one would need to look at both the presence of both B and T cell epitopes. Now, why both of them are required? You would remember from my classes that you need to have you know most of the B cell are T cell dependent that for a B cell to get activated it can do so independently unlike T cells which require the antigen to be presented in the context of class 1 or 2 molecules B cells can recognize native conformations or native proteins. So, whereas activation process itself for most B cells well all B cells in fact is independent of any other accessory cell the fact remains that most B cells require T cell help with respect to cytokine secretion or you know provided by the T cell as well as for providing the co-stimulatory signals. So, automatically then a peptide synthetic peptide should have both T and B cell epitopes. So, that the chances of both T and B cells coming closer together in an activated state becomes the chance becomes much uh, uh, much more. However, in case the synthetic peptide has only B cell epi epitopes like would happen in case of a hapten the T cell help can be provided by carrier proteins. 
in case of vaccines now this would be fine in animal studies but in case of designing vaccines for human use of course it would be at, of utmost importance to have both tnb cell epitopes present in a in the same molecule same fragment because one would always wonder which carrier proteins to use in case of human immunization now how does one identify these synthetic peptides which you know i mean what what will what tells you that these would be relevant these are the sequences that would be or this is the region of the protein which would induce not only antibodies to that relevant protein but is also able to neutralize that becomes important to do that now a part of this seminar or this lecture i have already dealt with in my lectures on uh, antigens how does one identify b cell epitopes but since we are talking about synthetic peptides i'll go over this a little bit briefly let's say you have a protein now from a pathogen you have the amino acid sequence but you'd like to find out which of these regions are b cell epitopes studying the reactivity of proteins this can be done by studying the reactivity of the proteins with anti serum rays to the fragments which fragments those which are made by you know obtained by limited proteolysis of the antigen which are made by or synthesized as solid phase peptides or if one uses recombinant dna technology then expression of truncated fragments of genes so you have the gene of the particular protein corresponding to the particular protein then it's not difficult to now truncate the gene from either the 5 or the 3 prime and then you know get smaller and smaller fragments and find out which of these now can let's say yield antibodies of any consequence of any significance an alteration of obtaining truncated fragments one can have expression of overlapping fragments i have again uh, this is also a repetition of what i have dealt with but now this the emphasis could be a little bit different one can also carry out epitope analysis by cleaving protein antigens by uh, chemical or enzymatic methods the ones that are commonly used you know to be able to identify again let's say you have uh, monoclonal antibodies to a particular protein and you know that one of the monoclonal antibodies is able to inhibit um uh, replication of that particular uh, virus or or a bacterium so this is only an, an example that i'm giving you or let's say it's a particular and an, you have an enzyme as the antigen and you have monoclonal antibodies to this particular enzyme and you find one of the monoclonal antibodies is able to uh, inhibit the enzyme activity that means it's not allowing substrate binding let's say or you have an anti you have a a toxin molecule and you find that amongst let's say a group of five monoclonal antibodies one of them is able to neutralize the toxin activity or is able to prevent the toxin from binding to its receptor or preventing the toxin from gaining entry into the cell and therefore toxicity now you'd like to find out instead of using the toxin you can't use a toxin as a whole for injecting you know for active immunization because the toxin would be toxic so instead suppose you would like to use a fragment of this particular toxin which would afford and you'd like to see whether this can you know protect uh, 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 the cells or an individual from toxic activity or maybe just inhibiting the transport of that toxin so to do that one can fragment okay this uh, the premise here is that you already have monoclonal antibodies you know and that's what we started out with that one of the monoclonal antibodies is able to affect this 
So, using the monoclonal antibody you can identify how would you do that is cleave the protein by different methods into smallest fragments cyanogen bromide which cleaves after methionine, formic acid which cleaves the aspartic acid proline bond. Now, this of course, not all molecules have, but if your molecule has it then you can use that trypsin which cleaves at lysine or arginine, cross tryptin which cleaves only at arginine. Now, let us say you use all these four different procedures by which you can cleave the fragments of the you cleave the, fra the protein into fragments and this digested mixture can be electrophorized. And this is one such very simple uh, diagram that you have the undigested molecule and the one that is fragmented by it could be any of the four methods that I mentioned. And now you have an identical gel which is transferred to a blotting membrane and then using the monoclonal antibody which I said would be of uh, you know, which, which has the capacity to uh, neutralize toxin activity. Now, this of course, is not monoclonal antibody let us say one monoclonal antibody identifies this another monoclonal antibody identifies this. In any case when you have different fragments you may you can get more than one fragment that is identified even by a monoclonal antibody. This smaller stretch would definitely be a part of the larger stretch. So, if you do an N-terminal amino acid sequencing you know where does this fragment come from and if you have identified this is around 1500. Uh, so, let us say a hundred and you know about uh, a small fragment of amino acids corresponding to that. Then you can go on to identifying, uh, identifying the peptides by solid phase synthesis where you can literally find out the core epitopic region. Now, this is a little bit more expensive procedure, but it gives you precisely a peptide corresponding to approximately 1 to 8 amino acids which forms the core of the epitope. The solid phase peptide synthesis is done in the following way that there, uh, there are this is typically done on, um, on pins which are uh, well depicted here not as pins, but the pins have uh, reactive groups on which one can start synthesizing peptides up to about 13 to 15 residues starting from the C terminus. And then you can make a series of peptides with just a shift of one amino acid. Now, these can then be checked for binding to the monoclonal antibody. Remember the one that I said a little while ago has been identified to have neutralizing activity. Now, we already have identified from the previous experiment a stretch of large uh, peptides like let us say um, 25 or maybe well 35 which are capable of binding the antibody. And now you go to fragments of or peptides generated in sequence from this stretch. Let us say from the third you can you make 13 more peptides overlapping one another by 12 amino acids. That means, peptide 1 contains residues 1 to 13, peptide 2 contains residues 2 to 14 and then peptide 3 would contain residues 3 to 15 and so on. And then you check for binding and definitely you will be able to identify the precise sequence to which the monoclonal antibodies then is a question of just synthesizing the peptide. Alternatively, one can express different overlapping fragments corresponding to a particular protein by taking the gene and you amplify fragments of the gene cloning each one and expressing the protein. So, now you would have fragments number 1 which let us say is from 1 to 100 the next one is from 50 to 150. So, you have fragments of 100 amino acids and now these can be checked for binding by ELISA by western blot and then you can narrow down the region to which that monoclonal antibody which has relevance has an epitope. Then again one can either by molecular biology approaches itself then make let us say that you have the region which is here 
because peptide 1 and peptide 2 or fragment 1 and fragment 2 bind. So, you know it is in the overlap region and then by subsequent deletion and addition one can narrow down even further. So, that one can make a synthetic peptide. Another approach would be gene constructs made with truncations on the 5 prime side or 3 prime side. So, protein fragments expressed and checked for binding with antibodies. So, you have now the gene sequence 5 prime 3 prime side and you can start now truncating the protein and this one can if you have the crystal structure of the protein actually it becomes even easier because you then know that the truncations can be made in such a fashion that you do not uh, abrogate any of the secondary structures. You know, so, the protein can be folded correctly when expressed and as recombinant protein. So, you can again you are able to identify. So, chemically synthesized peptides have various applications in biological sciences. We know that they can mimic naturally occurring peptides or segments of proteins and can be used as diagnostic reagents and safe immunogens. Now, chemically synthesized peptides have various applications in biological sciences. This surmise is of course, only based you know, this can only be if these synthesized peptides are able to mimic the corresponding region in the context of the entire molecule. Now, this is something that I cannot emphasize more. Only then can they mimic the segments of the protein all right, but we know now that of course, peptides are being used. So, obviously, it is possible you just have to hit upon the right synthetic peptide. Now, where synthetic peptides so far have not come into uh, the you know there are no success stories with respect to synthetic peptides as immunogens. Synthetic peptides are extremely useful as diagnostic reagents. One very good example I can tell you is synthetic peptides to the human human immunodeficiency virus the AIDS virus is being used are being used not is are there are several peptides which are being used in diagnostics. HIV you know to be able to work with the virus one needs a very restricted and very safe laboratory zone. Therefore, people would of course, not be able to use uh, work with the viruses, but one can always work with synthetic peptides corresponding to the virus. Now, taking making observations from uh, antibodies generated in humans, you know this has also lent a lot of information that one can take you know, people have taken antibodies looked at the antibody response from various individuals infected individuals infected with HIV of course, uh, those that have been infected and have come down with the symptoms, those who have been infected, but are long time protected, those that have been infected with the virus, but have still have shown mild symptoms. So, looking at the neutralizing you know this gave um, information on which antibodies were relevant with respect to neutralization of the virus. There are individuals who have been infected and have you know just not had any symptoms whatsoever. So, that means they are able to combat the infection, combat the disease, combat the virus itself. So, taking a cue from all this a large number of peptides corresponding to the envelope protein of the virus which have been identified and these peptides are being used to coat ELISA plates to be able to find out whether a person is infected or not. Peptides can be used as diagnostic reagents and extremely safe immunogens. Right. So, now how does one now, uh, this I talked about HIV human, uh, human immunodeficiency virus and there it was possible for people to look at the immune responses and find out which of these might give a clue with respect to the um, infectivity status of a person, whether a person I mean as, as diagnostic. 
in other cases where such information is not available or such sera are not available, how would can one identify B cell epitopes? Like I said a little while ago, algorithms are available for predicting B and T cell epitopes. T cell epitope prediction is a little bit more difficult because remember predicting T cell epitope means one would need to predict not only the region that would bind of the peptide that binds to the T cell receptor, but also that part of the peptide now which would dock on to class 1 and 2 molecules. We do know that for docking on to class 1 and 2 molecules, there are certain sequences which are absolutely essential. So, not all peptides that are generated by cleaving of the proteins intracellularly actually can be immunogenic with respect to T cell epitopes. So, for predicting T cell epitope one also needs to take into consideration the sequence of the molecules of the peptides which can dock on to the highly polymorphic class 1 and 2 molecules of humans. B cell epitope prediction however, is much simpler compared to T cell epitopes. So, how does one identify B cell epitopes? The algorithms are based on the following parameters. Each of these of course, also has relevance. B cell epitope can be predicted by the four parameters hydrophilicity, hydrophobicity of that particular stretch of uh, amino acid, the surface probability of this stretch of amino acids on the molecule, you know we are when we, when we say surface probability is with respect to the folded conformation of the protein and availability of this on the surface of the molecule. Because remember I have always kept saying that B cell epitopes will B cells recognize through the antigen receptor native conformations, the protein as such. So, therefore, all molecules or all antigenic determinants therefore, would be on the surface or at least these are the ones that would be relevant. Acrophilicity as well as flexibility. So, acrophilicity is accessibility. You know, even if the molecule is not, even if the molecule is on the surface, but if it is not accessible because of uh, presence of glycans or phosphates or any post translation modification, then that is not available for B cell interaction. Now, flexibility is that you, you might remember that I have, uh, when we dealt with uh, antigen antibody interaction, though antigen antibody interaction is dependent totally on is dependent on conf, uh, conf, uh, complementarity between the two paratope and the epitope. We know that after the first interaction, there can be induced fit uh, process taking place, which allows these interaction to become tighter with time. So, therefore, the molecule on the surface or the epitope should become should be flexible. People have shown that though the initial binding may have a particular, the first contact may have uh, give a binding of an affinity x, this might increase would increase because of flexibility of the antigenic epitope, which can now fit the paratope and thereby there is increase in the affinity or stronger binding. So, flexibility. Also, et epitopes. Now, because of all this, epitopes would be more on bends than beta sheets, because beta sheets are always usually in the interior of the molecule and the beta bends would be exterior of the molecule. So, epitopes would therefore, likely to be on beta bends. So, there are also general rules for predicting B cell antigenic determinants. The rules are again based on the four parameters I mentioned. Antigenic peptides should be located in solvent accessible regions. 
and contain both hydrophobic and hydrophobic hydrophilic residues. One that which would mean that again these would be more likely to be surface exposed because in an aqueous solution in the protein would always have a folded conformation such that there would be more hydrophilic regions outside of the molecule. So, solvent accessible. Predicting B cell antigenic determinants on peptides which lie in long loops connecting secondary structures and avoiding helical regions. Now, of course, there are reports where uh, antigenic determinants have been found on helical regions, but much more on beta bends. So, in a secondary structure prediction, if a region is corresponding to a beta bend and also this region happens to be definitely on the surface, then it is more like most likely to be an epitope or an antigenic determinant of the protein. Now, third rule peptides in the N and C terminal regions are usually the immunogenic ones or, or harbor the antigenic determinant, because these are usually solvent accessible the N and the C termini again I am saying usually and these are unstructured. So, they are likely to be epitopes again I will reiterate what I said earlier with res re respect to acrophilicity consensus sites for N glycosylation especially in case of cell surface glycoproteins can be uh, deleted you know as being an epitope because post translation modification even in even in a, if happens to be in a region which is hydrophilic and surface probable may not be an epitope because the glycan would inhibit the B cell receptor from binding the epitope. Are there peptides which are being used as antigens for diagnostics? There are several, but the ones that are known are synthetic envelope GP 41 peptide which is used for different you know to diagnose the I mean, infection at different stages of infection in human immunodeficiency virus type 1 infection. So, synthetic this is very much in the market and there are like I told you a little earlier that glycoprotein 41 there are different epitopes that are being you know synthetic peptides corresponding to different epitopes. So, this is a success story. Also what is in the market are peptides corresponding to rheumatoid arthritis. Now, how does if you might remember one of the reasons for autoimmune disease rheumatoid arthritis is um, antibodies you know accessibility of a particular region on the F C region of immunoglobulin G, which becomes accessible because of let us say lack of appropriate glycosylation. Now, to be able to find out if the arthritis is and because of an autoimmune disease, it is a rheumatoid arthritis than inflammatory arthritis or osteoarthritis, then antibodies can be measured in the blood of these individuals to a region a synthetic peptide corresponding to the region in the FC portion, which is available in these individuals because of lack of appropriate glycosylation. So, this is also another success story. Not in human so much, but synthetic peptide based vaccines have been shown to elicit antibodies against animal pathogens. And the again a success story is foot and mouth disease and canine parvovirus. Now, let me go into uh, success stories with respect to synthetic peptides which have been used to raise antibodies against antigens which are very difficult to obtain from um, 
uh, from cells let us say. Now, let us say one is looking at large molecules, large antigens which are found intracellularly. Now, the concentration of these proteins is extremely low even if you one is able to one decides to isolate the protein, how does one do it? Especially if you do not have antibodies like I said in a little while ago that synthetic peptides can be used really in those areas you know in, in those contexts where it is difficult to purify the protein, the native protein. To even be able to purify the native protein ultimately to be able to characterize it, suppose you obtain the synthetic peptide corresponding to this protein. Let us say you know the, um, the, the gene for the protein, you know the gene sequence from which one can determine the amino acid sequence and now using different algorithms one can you know one can use let us say 3, 4 algorithms which are available for predicting B cell epitopes. You make the synthetic peptide corresponding to the most probable um, B cell epitope and now make antibodies to this. Antibodies to this can now first one can check whether the antibodies can actually recognize the protein which is present in the cells. After one gets the um, uh, ok go ahead signal then you can make a immune affinity column from the anti you know the antibodies to the synthetic peptides and now using this one can hope to purify the protein from a multitude of proteins present in the cell lysate. One such experiment I just like to tell you there are several I mean millions of such reports which are available in literature, but let me just point out this is a immunohistochemistry micrograph of breast cancer. There are three different breast cancer tissues and this panel shows the A panel shows the sections of the tissues breast cancer tissue has been stained using monoclonal antibodies which are raised to a peptide corresponding to a protein which is expressed in very high concentrations in upon carcinogenesis upon cancer establishment. And one can see that the antibody which is raised to a peptide is able to bind to that particular mucin 1 protein present. Now, this is a monoclonal antibody to an estrogen dependent protein, but this is a larger protein and of course, this is the control. So, one can use this. Now, we know that this mucin 1 peptide overexpression occurs in upon the transformation of normal breast tissue to cancerous one. So, the monoclonal antibody is not to the whole molecule mucin peptide, but it is to a fragment thereof. In fact, if one is able to purify the mucin 1, the entire protein and immunize for getting antibodies is very difficult to get the antibodies because especially in case of breast cancer the protein becomes highly glycosylated the mucin 1 protein. Therefore, if one makes the peptide then you can get definitely antibodies to the protein and can be used to in diagnosis. So, you can see very clearly so the, like uh, this is just an example there are very large number of such cases where antibodies to synthetic peptides can be used in diagnosis not only what I mentioned earlier with respect to diagnosis of diseases such as HIV, but also to find out whether a particular tumor is benign or malignant. This is yet one more example of antibodies made to a receptor. Now, especially you know receptors are difficult to purify, especially receptors like gonadotropin releasing hormone receptor which is made up of which is uh, which belongs to the family of 7 transmembrane receptor. So, it the this polypeptide spans the membrane of the cell 7 times 
So, therefore, extremely hydrophobic, difficult to extract the protein from the cell membrane, it is difficult to obtain the receptor to purify the receptor. Therefore, now once the sequence of the receptor became known, then using algorithms to the extracellular domain and the loops, a synthetic peptides was synthesized that this was injected into mice, monoclonal antibodies were made. A few of the monoclonal antibodies recognize the native receptor and one of these monoclonal antibodies is shown here to bind to T 4 7 D a breast carcinoma cell line which over expresses this receptor. Normally GNR receptors present in the pituitary gonadotrophs, but upon carcinogenesis some cancer cells over express this receptors and therefore, this antibody can also be used as diagnostic tool. So, I have just given you a glimpse of where and in which context synthetic peptides can be used. Synthetic peptides can be used both in diagnosis as well as as vaccines. So, in summary the cross reactivity of antibodies raised against synthetic epitopes with the native protein has facilitated the development of a new generation of synthetic peptide vaccines, which are safe and potentially useful against a number of viral diseases. Now, why is it safe? You might remember that in case of certain viruses, which have been used even though at in an attenuated form have been used as active immunogens. In some cases, they have induced the disease itself because of reversal of this attenuation. Synthetic peptides, this does not arise, this danger does not arise. So, synthetic peptides are particularly beneficial when full length protein is difficult to isolate or to toxic. So, these are the benefits of the synthetic peptides and use of synthetic peptides in vaccine development as well as in diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you.